AviationPros.com is the portal website for AMT, airport business, and ground support worldwide magazines. Visit daily for breaking news, industry blogs, and insightful articles from our magazine's editorial team. And don't forget to sign up for our publication's daily e-newsletters. It's all at AviationPros.com. Hello and welcome to the Aviation Pros Podcast. I'm Christina Marsh, Editor of Airport Business, and today we're speaking with former Airport Business 40 Under 40 recipient and President and CEO of Conoco, Shri Kumar. Shri joins us to share his unique success story and give advice to other industry professionals. Shri, uh, first thing first, thank you so much for joining us today. Yep, yeah, thank you for having me. This is quite an honor. So what made you want to be part of the Avian? aviation industry? Well, it's actually kind of funny. I, like many young people today, did not know there was an aviation industry. I was always interested in math. I was always interested in science. I was always interested in construction equipment and big machines. So when I found out that there was the opportunity to not just uh, work on major projects that had this huge impact, you know, travelers, going through the airports, um, working across the country, working with the federal government and the FAA. Uh, I was really intrigued to be able to go down that path. And I'm still, I mean, frankly, I'm in awe. You know, every time I go out to one of our job sites and I see those planes running around and the airport's essentially a city of its own, I'm just thrilled to be in the aviation in the in the industry in the first place. So how did you go from having an interest in aviation to landing a job at Conoco? Well, this is actually also kind of a funny story. Conoco found me. Um, to this day, I'm actually not sure how they found me. Christy Shadowins, she still works for us. She reached out to me during my education at Michigan State and asked to sit down for a quick phone interview. So I had a chat with her. And a few days later, uh, I was actually out in Minneapolis interviewing for some jobs out there. I got a phone call from Dave Hundley. He was Conoco's vice president. And he asked me to come sit down for an in-person interview because they liked my qualifications. He said that it would be in Detroit. And I said, sorry, I can't get to Detroit. Goodbye. Uh, just as fate would have it, he called me back again. I actually turned Conoco down again. And the third time he called, he said, what if we sit down for a Skype interview? Do you think you could get Skype? Now, this, of course, was oh, 2011, so well before prominence in video communication technology. But I sat down at a dining room table and did the Skype interview. And uh, Dave went on to be my boss for the next 11 years. And uh, here we are. Wow. So... Okay, prior to becoming CEO and president at Conoco at just 32 years old, you were the youngest employee to be asked to join Conoco's senior leadership team in their over 30 year history. How did you set yourself up for success for such a successful career? You know, well, actually both the incidents you describe, if incidents is the right word, it was Connie who trusted me to be able to fill both of those highly, highly uh, prominent roles. So um, definitely part of setting yourself up for success is finding uh, a mentor and a coach who trusts you and is willing to push you, willing to let you take risks. They have your back. If you fail, they're willing to answer your questions. You have to have the ability to learn uh, outside your company as well as inside. One thing that I did early on was get heavily involved in the industry, and I also found myself mentors who worked for other companies. What that meant was that, especially if I was having a tricky situation that had to do with my workplace or my progression or a challenge that I was facing with some people at my work, I could call those mentors and have an unbiased forum uh, incidentally, with no to few repercussions, um, as compared to calling somebody in my company where maybe I couldn't talk those things through. Um, you know, having yourself a circle of mentors 
who guide you in different topics who you can call when you need. Um, that's definitely a, a key to be able to take on these leadership roles. The other thing that I, uh, you know, kind of always tell people is you've got to be prepared. Um, having run some of my own businesses before, um, having taken different courses in college, you know, outside my engineering degree, I was very intentional about that. And that gave me the tools that were necessary so that when these opportunities came up, I was ready for them. And I was very, very grateful uh, to be presented with them. And again, you know, without the trust of the people who gave me those opportunities in the first place, uh, I, I couldn't have done it. So you interviewed three different times. Conical clearly wanted you to join their team. What made you so enticing to them? And what advice do you have for other young professionals to stand out and to be successful? That's another great question that I think is not commonly discussed in the right ways. You know, we always tell people, get good grades, go to school. That's how you get a job. That's your big ticket to the big show. It's important that when you're in school, you become well-rounded. And that importance sticks with you through the rest of your life. Especially as an engineer, not having some of the abilities that are uh, kind of typically associated with uh, engineers, you know, some of this, you know, lack of communication skills, um, you know, those sorts of things. You really have to work on where your weaknesses are and make sure that you're ready to fill this role as your ideal self and in your ideal career. And so often as we're on the trajectory, we say, I need to get my PDH hours. You know, I've got to spend some time at this meeting. And it's really important to ask yourself, um, you know, how are you fulfilling the shoes of the person that you really want to be? Um, I think those things are just so critical to understanding how am I going to develop myself right now? so that I can be ready for the next big thing. Yeah, and the big thing is uh, being CEO and president. So what motivated you to undertake uh, such a big undertaking at this point in your career? This is something that, um, as you probably know, um, did not come about in the right way. You know, Connie, our, our CEO and our founder, she passed away very suddenly a couple of years ago. And she had been training me to take on this role at some point. And she'd been training me for five, six years. It would have been nice. Well, it would have been nice to have another 65 years of training in order to take on this role. But I had always wanted to own my own business. And I had made that clear very, very early in my career at Conoco. Hey, I want to get involved. Hey, I want to be a piece of this. And I want to be a big piece. Um, I gave her and Dave a pitch where I described what would I do as an owner? What do I see as the expectations for myself as an owner? And um, the fact that they were willing to sit down and listen to that was flattering, but also that really forced me to think about, do I want this? Um, especially with the way that it happened, the company was in a situation where not only we were you know, could we let down our clients who were counting on us for deliverables and to fill out certain contractual requirements as a DBE? Um, but we were going to let down our employees. You know, if we didn't find a way to move this show forward, everybody was going to, they were going to have to pack up and go home. And so we put together this plan that, uh, you know, enabled us to keep all of our clients, keep all of our employees. We made every payroll, we made every project deadline. And, um, you know, we we just kind of knew that was a possibility. And even though it's a big risk, which is something I think young people need to know as well, um, it's, a, it's a risk that I and my fiance uh, decided to take. As you know, the path to a successful career is not always an easy one. What challenges have you faced and how did you overcome them? There's, uh, I think like a lot of people, I've got a long list of challenges. 
you know, um, I grew up in a single family household. Um, my dad emptied our bank accounts when I was about eight. My sister was five and my little sister was three. And we have not heard from or seen him since. And uh, that's a part of my childhood that I think not a lot of people know about, but it definitely impacted how did I go to school? How was my home life? And I'm gracious to my mom and my family every day for uh, supporting uh, each other through that challenge. One of the interesting things about that challenge, you know, a lot of people said, oh, wasn't that tough? Yeah, it was tough, but I'm thankful for it every day. I think not enough people are thankful for the challenges that they have the opportunity to face and then overcome. You know, if I had grown up in another regular household, uh, I would be another regular person. I think, I mean, I think my colleagues probably sometimes wish that I had more normalcy, but it's those challenges and those tough events, especially in our personal lives that, uh, you know, they show us who we really are. They give us the opportunity to flex what's best about us and improve what we think maybe needs improvement. And how we overcome those challenges, how we show ourselves during times of challenge, that paints a picture of who are we going to be. So, um, you know, many, many challenges that I have faced, but that was probably the biggest one. And I, as crazy as it sounds, I encourage people to be thankful for the challenges that you were able to face and that you were able to overcome. And also remember to be thankful for the people who helped you through them. That is a very powerful message. Um, so, all right. In 2017, you were nominated as a chair for the ACC Young Professionals Forum. You currently reside on the ACC Board of Directors. You're also the, pres the current president of the National Society of Professional Engineers Northern Kentucky chapter. And last year, you were named a recipient of the Airport Business 40 Under 40 Award. How has being part of these organizations helped propel you in your career? You know, the the first thing organizations do, when you read it all out like that, it sounds like a lot. The first thing these organizations do, they provide an opportunity. You know, it's an opportunity for you to test your mettle. It's an opportunity for you, of course, to meet people, influential people. And it's really an opportunity for you to prove yourself to you. You know, no one at Conoco ever said, hey, go out into this organization. It's critical that you get on the board right? Nobody ever said that. And so it really was, okay, what can I do in this organization that's good for the company? Yeah, but also good for me. You know, ACC is uh, the perfect example of this, Airport Consultants Council. Connie, right away, you know, she led me to the door and gave me the boot and said, get outside and play. Um, she forced me to get outside my comfort zone. You know, she had no qualms about saying, hey, I know you're 22 or whatever, but sign up to moderate a session in front of an audience, right? Take on a leadership role. Yeah, I, I know you're new to this, but ask questions, try it out, do a good job, and uh, you know, we think you'll be okay. Because she gave me these challenges and her and Dave were constantly pushing me to get out there, I was able to find my, like, uh, I was able to find my unique voice in ACC. And I offered this unique perspective and people got a chance to see that. Um, you know, for a, a new or young leader, your career is going to be guided by efficacy. You know, how effective are you? And these organizations are the perfect place to learn how to be effective. So let's talk about your vision for Conoco. How do you see the company being a valuable pillar within the industry? And what are your goals to to do that? Well, um, you know, our biggest value that we kind of see is that we're going to change a little bit of the landscape in how the industry works. You know, as a small company, we have the ability to maybe try and do some experimental things that other companies don't get to do. So 
while we could focus on, you know, our value being uh, the most accurate numbers, you know, excellence and workmanship, which which are among our values, I think one of the key things we're going to bring to the industry is altering how do we approach work. And we're going to do that at Conoco in our own way. You know, um, there are some things we're working on that we uh, still have under wraps that you'll see coming out soon. But, you know, right now it's no secret that at our company, we're 100 percent focused on our employees. We are giving them the best tools, resources, uh, exposure, experiences, all the things that they need to get each individual person at our company where they want to go in their professional lives. One key point that I would love to pass on is that every person, no matter what stage of their career journey they're in, has a career path in front of them. They have career objectives. They have room for growth. We always, not always, but often, I guess, think of a career path being something belongs to a young person, but even somebody who's been in the industry for 35 years has a career path. Their career path and their career goals might include retirement, but they still have a goal that they want to reach. And so one thing we're doing at Conoco is making sure that everybody at every level is empowered to be able to meet their career goals. We have a big responsibility to our employees um, as a CEO and I think as a leader, you know, even a a vice president or a person on a leadership team, you feel that weight. You know, you are responsible for helping your employees not just accomplish their professional goals, but some of their life goals as well. Uh, you know, you sign their paychecks or you help build the organization that processes their paychecks. So um, we, right now we remain dedicated to our employees. And then the other part of our value, as I alluded to, you know, we are relentlessly dedicated to our clients. Um, we answer every phone call. Uh, you know, we meet crazy deadlines. Every member of our team is someone that you can trust to give you what you need. We are able at Conoco to show people in this industry what commitment means. And I think that's something that is really being seen right now. And I hope that other organizations are able to pick up on that and generate their own value as well. So you have a passion for growing DBE and minority owned business participation within the aviation industry. How do you want to build that inclusion and what value do you see in growing inclusion in airport improvement projects? That's a big, big, big question. You know, there are so many facets to this. I think that I would probably start by quoting my friend and my mentor, frankly, Jason Singleton. He works for a company called Freedom Industries. They do not work in aviation, but uh, he likes to say that diamond sharpens diamond. You know, so often we think that it is sort of up to or the responsibility of big companies to generate DBE participation. But we have this responsibility as a DBE to lift up other DBEs. You know, I do just want to touch on the fact that we live in an era where the federal government is willing to label a business owned by someone who's a minority or someone who, uh, uh, you know, is female or a, a veteran as disadvantaged. Uh, I don't agree with that terminology at all. You know, what we've seen is that having diversity of thought, diversity of leadership is an advantage. But, uh, you know, that's the world that we live in for whatever reason. And we have the onus on us to support each other in addition to sharing the message of the value of DBEs beyond their status. You know, at Conoco, when we have a meeting, we use DBEs um, and local, uh, locally owned businesses for catering. Um, our PR firm, our HR firm, our learning management consultant, they're all woman-owned. Our uh, primary recruiter is a veteran-owned business. Um, for our meetings, we look to team, uh, team with local partners. Um, one great example is the Greater Cincinnati Foundation in Cincinnati, Ohio. You know, they are so committed to the local community 
that they, when they built out their space, they only used local DBE contractors. Um, there are plenty of partners out there that are willing to uplift DBEs. And I think the value, right, of having different minds, different voices, different perspectives at the table is clear. When you get more voices, you gain more perspective that reduces the number of challenges you have to face later on down the line, and it enhances the quality of whatever you're delivering. Along the way, the diverse perspectives give you the opportunity to do things like reduce the cost of a project that you're working on to deliver it quicker. So I think uh, the value of diversity almost speaks for itself, and we as a DBE firm and other DBE firms have this responsibility as well as the big firms to grow inclusion and foster inclusion. Sri, this has been a very enlightening conversation and I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Yeah, thank you. I uh, do want to drop in two small pieces of advice for any emerging leaders who are listening, not necessarily a young leader, but any emerging leader who is up and coming, um, you know, I want to encourage you to build trust at your organization, uh, regardless of what your job is, what your job title is, what you do on a daily basis, all your actions need to move towards that trust building. That's a lesson that I learned early on, but that is very difficult to implement. And it is something that I am still working on um, still working on doing, showing, and building with all my actions, all my communication. Um, and then at the end of the day, I uh, I want to quote another friend and mentor, Matt Wenham over at CNS. And I think some of the questions that you've asked me, you know, kind of reflect how hard that I've worked. And one day he just told me, remember to take time to be human. I think so often we think, especially in an industry that's moving at such a pace, we are identified by our job or our job title. Our lives are consumed by engineering, stamping plans, by being an architect, by advocating. Whatever it is that we do in this industry, sometimes it consumes our lives and then it starts to consume our identity. Hard work is great. And it's uh, a key element of getting to where you want to go. But this industry is about human beings. This industry is about improving the lives of human beings. And as a result, this industry is about relationships. No matter what level you're at, it's absolutely critical that even in the midst of your work, even when things are busy, you take that time to be a human being. Absolutely. Those are two very great pieces of advice. And I want to thank you for being vulnerable and willing enough to share what has worked for you and what hasn't worked for you in this industry. Thank you, Christina. Again, I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's, as I said, quite an honor to even be asked. And uh, I had a fantastic time talking to you. So just a sincere thank you for setting this up. Thanks again for listening to today's podcast. Stay up to date on industry news, current issues, and information specifically for airports, airport operations, FBOs, and airport-based business by subscribing to Airport Business Daily Newsletter. And as always, please continue to visit aviationpros.com.